to grow. Good morning, family. It is indeed a blessing to be with you this morning. Before another word is said, would you please bow and pray with me? We thank you, Father, for the blessings that you will bestow upon us on this day and each day following. Father, we ask that your presence be among us to guide us, to love us, and to keep us. Bless the speaker this morning and bless the hearer so that the message will be received and repeated to other ears as needed. And Father, as we come about through this world among those who do not know you, give us a fresh word, a blessed word to speak to them so they may be guided towards you. And Father, we will praise you, glorify you, we will honor you. And we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all the children of God said, amen. amen. Family, it is so good to see you this morning, so to speak. It's definitely good that you decided to praise the Lord this morning and join us in worship. Thank you for welcoming us into your home or wherever you happen to be. So why don't we go ahead and let's get started with this morning's message. We will be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. That's the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. And the Bible states, Be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Thus, whenever you do charitable giving, do not blow a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in synagogues and on the streets so that they will receive praise from them. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. But when you do your giving, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your gift may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray while standing in synagogues and on the street corners so that people can see them. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your inner room, close the door, and pray to your father in secret. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. When you pray, do not babble repetitiously like the Gentiles, because they think that by their many words they will be heard. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So pray this way, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your sins. When you fast, do not look sullen like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive so that people will see them fasting. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Blessings to all who heed the word of God. Amen. And the title of this morning's message is, What is Your Motive? Again, what is your motive? Now, the words of Jesus, they inspire me to recall a spiritual philosophy that I had when I was a boy, maybe about the ages, age of 11 or 12. I believe that a good person would be welcomed into heaven. Now, I believe a good person was a person who said nice things, good, did good things, or maybe took, a, took, took it upon themselves just to welcome someone into a cold or seeming unwelcome place. Or maybe they just performed some random act of kindness. But during this period of time when I held this philosophy, something happened to totally change it. Well, my Uncle Cleveland, who I often spent time with talking about things of spirituality, he invited me to attend a worship service with him. Well, I attended the worship service with him, 
And the preacher that day said something that changed my spiritual philosophy forever and also sent me on a spiritual journey. He said, now listen up, he said, good people may not make it into heaven. Think about that. Good people may not make it into heaven. My spiritual world was turned upside down from that moment forward. I wondered, what's wrong with being a good person? Well, a good person is someone who is thought by other people to be good based upon the things they say or the things they do. However, there's an other hand to the situation. The motive behind the good behavior, it may be selfishness, greed, or some works of the flesh. So although a person is thought to be good because they do good things, I had not considered the motives for their behavior. For example, let's talk about compliments. We can likely agree that compliments are a good thing and they help you to feel good. But has anyone ever complimented you and said good things about you, and then they give you so many compliments that you begin to get suspicious, and you wonder about their behavior, and you eventually find out they were complimenting you because they wanted something from you. See, the act of, uh, of complimenting you was good, but the motive behind the behaviors was questionable. And this is what the preacher meant when he said good people may not make it into heaven because good people may do nice things. They may do good things, but their motives are questionable. So we may not care about the motives. We mostly care about the results. For instance, we don't care how bacon is made. We simply want you to cook it, fry it till it's crispy, lay it aside those eggs and those grits, and we're good. However, God cares about the motives behind our behavior. God cares about that which is in your heart because it is that in your heart which inspires all you say and do. God wants us to, by faith, pursue righteousness. And Jesus makes this clear, very clear in verse 1. Follow along with me. It says, be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So Jesus is speaking to those who act in a righteous manner but have worldly motives. Their motive is to gain your favor rather than the favor of God. So let's talk a little bit about righteousness. What is it? Well, it's a state of integrity of trustworthy and truthfulness for God, in God, and with your fellow man. Righteousness is going to be expressed through your speech and your behavior. The motive is always to do the will of God. And the prophet Malachi speaks well in chapter 3, verse 18, about righteousness. The prophet states, Then once more you will see that I make a distinction between the righteous and the wicked between the one who serves God and the one who does not. So according to the prophet, the righteous will serve God, and the wicked do not. The wicked serve themselves in one way or another. So this brings us back to our scripture selection. Jesus is speaking, speaking to our righteous acts of service through giving, through prayer, and through fasting, and warns us to act in faith. In our scripture selection, Jesus questions our motives and encourages us to not be like those who appear to be exhibiting fruits of the spirit, but have motives that are works of the flesh. The question for you and family, I'm always going to have a question for you. Are you guilty of having corrupt motives? Well, let's examine the scripture and then let the scripture examine us while we find out the truth about ourselves. And that brings us to our first point, the first of three. The first point is, what is your motive for giving? Verses two through four discusses that very thing. It discusses so-called charitable giving and includes instruction on the godly way of giving. Charitable giving is an act of compassion towards the needy. And in the book of Deuteronomy, 
chapter 15, verses 7 through 8 speaks to that. It says, if a fellow Israelite from one of our villages in the land that the Lord your God is giving you should be poor, you must not harden your heart or be insensitive to his impoverished condition. Instead, you must be sure to open your hand to him and generously give whatever he needs. Jesus commands that we be sensitive to the needs of the needy. The focus should be given to the needy and not ourselves. And to give in this manner is a true act of righteousness. However, it has been found that righteousness is not always the motive for our giving. And divine investigation, yes, divine investigation has led to identification of the suspect. He has been named. Jesus refers to the suspect in the scripture. Jesus calls the suspect, I wish I had a drum roll right now, a hypocrite. He states that they figuratively blow a trumpet before their giving so they may be the focus of praise. So I find the behavior of the hypocrites to be the equivalent of that of telemarketers. They call you to sell you something that they claim will be of great value to you. According to the telemarketer, what they have to sell you is going to be the greatest thing since the invention of air conditioning. Their tone is calm and reassuring. Their knowledge is impressive as they lay down the facts. There is one issue with all of this. It is their motive. Their motive is to get what they want from you. They are in it for personal gain. Now, I'm not necessarily comparing your giving to that of a telemarketer, but if the shoe fits, you need to shine it, put it on, tie it up, and wear it. The hypocrite is not concerned about the needy as much as they are concerned about being recognized for giving to the needy. They are in it for personal gain. So in return for their giving, they want to be in the church newsletter. They want to be on the church website with a picture of them giving. They want a plaque on the wall. They want some type of announcement so that publicly they will be recognized for giving. Why? Because they want praise. God has spoken on the subject and said the hypocrites, they can have their empty praise from man, but due to their motives, they will receive nothing from God. No comfort, no guidance, no peace, nothing. Just that temporary feeling of relief of the feeling. And God stated in verse 3, when we give, and follow along with me, family, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, do not announce your act of giving. Do not figuratively blow the trumpet, as Jesus said. It's not about you. It's about God. It's about glorifying God by your acts of righteousness. And any rewards you receive will be received from God. Therein lies the difference between the giving of the good and the giving of the righteous. See, a good person, they give, but it's under certain requirements and conditions that in some way will benefit them. But the righteous person, the righteous person gives because a child of God is in need. They seek to glorify God in their giving, and there is no thought about themselves. As it states in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 8, I repeat, be sure to open your hand to him and generously lend what he needs. And in this act of righteousness, God will be glorified, and that's what it's all about, glorifying God. And God will bless all who are involved. Amen? And that brings us to our second point, family. The second point is, what is your motive for praying, family? Buckle up your spiritual seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. So in verse 5, Jesus warns us against engaging in the prayer practices of hypocrites. He is so serious about the dilemma of poor motives in praying that he, he devotes a good portion of chapter 6 to that topic. He paints a picture, a picture of people praying in a public place for the sole purpose of gaining the attention of others. They want the spotlight to be on 
them when they pray rather than on God. I'm going to say that one more time. They are praying in a public place. Their goal, their motive is to pray so that the spotlight will be on them rather than God. Let that sit with you for a moment, friends. Jesus instructs us not to behave like the hypocrites when we pray. He has examined their motives and found them to be lacking. The hypocrites pray to gain admonition admiration, attention, and respect of others, what would cause a person to use prayer to feed their flesh? What would cause a person to rob God of an intimate relationship with God's children? Well, I can only assume the problem. I think that the problem is they are experiencing a host of adverse emotions and moods and that range from hopelessness to helplessness, to unhappiness. It is as if they are attempting to fill a God-sized hole within them with things of the world. And according to Jesus, the momentary relief of their hopelessness and unhappiness is their reward because they will receive no blessing, no blessing from God because they choose to receive the praise of man rather than give praise to God but they will receive no relief because of the motives behind their behavior. So I know what it feels like to have a God-sized hole within you. I have been there. It's an emptiness that you can spend your whole life trying to fill with things of the world and never come close. No car, no money, no house, no jewelry, no drug, no alcohol, no man, no woman. Nothing of this world is going to fill that hole. You will forever have that need to satisfy that craving and that emptiness because things of the world can't do it because that craving, that emptiness that you feel is a need to have God within your life. For example, have you ever wanted something so badly that you thought about it day and night? Maybe it was a person that you wanted to date or marry. Maybe you frequently imagine scenarios where you all would go here and there and do this and that. You felt that if you had this certain person in your life, everything would be all right. Well, anyone who has a few gray hairs would tell you, there is no way that what you're seeking can be found in another person. No person will ever satisfy your craving. No person will ever satisfy that feeling of emptiness. You cannot fill a God-sized hole with things of the world and people. It can only be filled with God. See, I've been there, and it wasn't until I sought God that I knew what it meant to have joy. It wasn't until I sought God that I knew what it meant to have peace. I finally knew comfort. God blessed me because I didn't care anymore about being good. I began my journey on the path to righteousness. As I sought God, my prayers changed. As I sought God, I prayed more often, and my prayers were more focused, sincere, and had more substance. As I pray now, I trust God only as God can and should be trusted. As I pray, I believe that God hears me. I believe that God is guiding me, and everything has changed because I now have an intimate relationship with God. And I believe that God will make everything all right. Amen. As for the hypocrite, this person is suffering, suffering from emptiness, helplessness, and happiness and distractions. They have been distracted from truth, God, and victory over their circumstances. It is as if they are surrounded by the perfect storm of distractions, poor decisions, and problems. And it's difficult to pray with intensity and with sincerity and humility under these conditions. But Jesus has the answer. Thank you, Lord. In verses 6 through 8, Jesus addresses the issue of praying while distracted and under pressure. Follow along with me, family. The Lord says, but whenever you pray, go into your inner room, close the door, and pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, 
do not babble repetitiously like the Gentiles, because they think by, the, by their many words they will be heard. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So, family, please don't assume that Jesus is cautioning, cautioning us against public prayer, because that's not what's happening here. Jesus is questioning our motives for prayer. Jesus requests that we build a prayer foundation through spending time alone with God praying. And in the Gospels, Jesus set the perfect example because Jesus often removed himself from the crowds to go to a private place to spend time with God in prayer. In doing so, he was renewed. He was energized and prepared to return to God's people. And in doing as Jesus did, we can do the same. We also can have that comfort and that confidence to return to the people of God and preach the word. So Jesus indicates that there is a private side to prayer, and we must develop it, and it can be done in a private place, free of distractions where we can be alone with God. So as our relationship with God develops, our spiritual and prayer life develops. These improvements will extend from private prayer to public prayer when we are praying with others. Then we will pray because we have submitted ourselves to God. And we want to know and live within the will of God and find a quiet place. Find a quiet place, family, so that you can be alone with God and pray and experience the blessings of God. The hypocrites, they don't know, don't even care to know about prayer. The hypocrites, they don't understand the nature of God. That's why they pray the way they do. That's why they have that misunderstanding and a style of prayer. They use many words that seem nonsensical. A sound prayer life is required in the pursuit of righteousness. It is grounded in faith and the motivation to have a right relationship with God. So Jesus gives us a perfect example. He gives us a perfect example of prayer with the Lord's prayer. And he speaks about it in verses 9 through 13. Follow along with me, family. Jesus says, so pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And Jesus goes into verses 14 and 15 to support the matter of forgiveness that he spoke of in the Lord's Prayer. Because it's that important. If Jesus says it twice, it's important. So in verses 14 and 15, Jesus states, For if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your sins. So Jesus provides the Lord's Prayer as a way to know God, a way to approach God by acknowledging God's uniqueness and our need for God's provisions and protection. Therein lies the difference between the prayer of the good and the prayer of the righteous. A good person may pray because they seek to have the attention of you, your attention. They want it on them, and their motive is not holy at all. They don't want their attention on God. They want it on them. But then a righteous person prays to hear, to be guided by God, and to glorify God. And James in chapter 5, verse 16, speaks about the prayers of the righteous. And you all have heard it before. The book of James says, the effectual Fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, the prayer of a, the effective prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Amen? And that brings us to the third and final point. What is your motive for fasting? In verses 16 through 18, Jesus discusses fasting because the hypocrites, they are still at it. They are still doing those sinful things. They are something else. It just makes you shake your head and go, mm, mm, mm. 
Jesus warns us about fasting only to be seen by people. The purpose of fasting is to control your flesh and develop a more intimate relationship with God, but not the hypocrites. They fast to feed the flesh and develop a more intimate relationship with no one. The fast, they fast in a dramatic way to let you know they have been fasting. Their desire is to gain the attention of people more than they desire the attention of God. So God states the, uh, the extent of their reward is the temporary, temporary, feeding of their flesh from the attention of people. And you all know how the attention of people is. Here today, gone tomorrow. But they will receive no blessings from God. No peace, no comfort, nothing. However, if you want the blessings of God as you fast, Jesus says, clean yourselves up. Know that this is a blessed time when your flesh is being placed under control of God and the devil is being held at bay. Amen? Your mind, body, and soul is being refreshed as you fast to begin anew with a strengthened relationship with God. God is rebuilding you, rebuilding you from the inside out. So when it's all said and done, you will hear the voice of God, you will know the will of God, and you will be obedient to the purpose within God. So will people see you? Will they notice you? Well, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But you won't care because you will be focused on God and what God is doing with you and through you. You will receive your reward. God will love you. God will protect you. God will provide for you. And God is going to keep you. All of your blessings begin with you having the proper motive. Therein lies the difference between the fasting of the good and the fasting of the righteous. A good person, they may fast, but it's going to be in some way that benefits them, such as being seen by others and thought to be religious. But a righteous person, that righteous person will fast because they want to have a more intimate relationship with God. They want to glorify God, and they have no thought for self. So, family, Jesus has fully warned us against behaving like a hypocrite and provided clear instruction, clear instruction that will prevent us from becoming one. Will you heed God's word? Because God judges the greatness of the servants by searching their hearts and examining their inner attitudes and seeing their deeds done in secret. God does care about the motives behind our behavior. So before I close, I just want to leave a few thoughts with you. The immediate harm in being a hypocrite is that a hypocrite will steal from God. If they will steal from God... How long before they steal from you? Not long. When a hypocrite steals love from God and uses it for their selfish purposes, how long before they steal love meant for family and uses it for selfish purposes? Not long. When a hypocrite steals time, time that was meant for God, and uses it for selfish purposes, how long before they steal time meant for their spouse, their job, or school to use for selfish purposes? Not long. When a hypocrite steals praise meant for God and uses it for selfish purposes, how long before he steals it from you? Because he wants praise from you to use for selfish purposes. How long? Not long. So if you ignore the words of Jesus, the hypocritical way of thinking will creep into other areas of your life. Once it robs you of your spiritual life, it has open access to every other area of your life. Sin will have access to your heart, your mind, and your soul. So if you're wondering how long it takes for sin to enter your heart, your mind, your soul, and take over your entire world, not long. Jesus has granted us a responsibility. A responsibility to gain greater spiritual awareness. 
He wants each of us to look within ourselves and examine our motives. He wants us to examine the reasons we do the things we do, examine the reasons we say the things we say, and take ownership, ownership of your part in all of that. You have to go to God. Confess the corrupt motives that are within you and go to God for correction. You need to confess the pain that you've been holding on to for all these years and go to God for healing. You need to confess the lies that you've been living and go to God for truth. You have to confess the sinful thoughts that plague your mind from day to day and go to God for guidance. Jesus clearly wants us to travel the path to righteousness. My prayer for each of us is that we be healed in the name of Jesus Christ, and be blessed to pursue God on the path to righteousness. And all of God's children said, amen. Family, I sincerely hope that this message has been a blessing to you, and that as you approach those who do not know the Lord, that you can impart this wisdom upon them. So, family, for those of you who have not accepted Jesus into their life, there is no better time than now. No better time than now. You are here, I'm here, and the presence of the Lord is among you. In, a, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it states, If you confess the Lord, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. If you are prepared, it is time to accept God. Why wait another moment? Why not accept him now as Lord and Savior and be placed on the path to righteousness? If you are prepared, let us pray. We thank you, Father, for this day and all the blessings that you will bestow within it. Father, we ask you to forgive us for all the ways in which we have trespassed against you. Father, we ask that you search our hearts, search our minds, search our souls. Remove anything that is not of you. And, Father, instill your wisdom, your love, and the Holy Spirit within us. Father, we claim to want a deeper, more substantial relationship with you, and we request it on this day. We request your presence in our lives, in our homes, on our job, and amongst our family. So, Father, we claim you as our Lord and Savior. We need you with us each day. We need your hedge of protection. We need your provisions. We need you. So, Father, we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that he died on the cross and was raised on the third day. And we accept him from this point forward as our Lord and Savior. And we thank you, Father, for this opportunity because now we have a choice between sin and righteousness, and we choose righteousness. So, Father, we give all the thanks to you. And we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all the people of God said, amen. Blessings to you, family.